stress management. Again, you can see that slide several times just because of the stress management. And this again is in light of our, uh, our ill animals, even though Skyler's pretty darn healthy. Um, but we've got the transition uh, of the, the sick animals coming off. His immune system is going to be, be down, and he is more apt to pick up other things, even if he was quarantined for one reason and you were staging him. Uh, it's going to put him at risk of picking up some other things that you weren't, uh, weren't thinking of. So again, stress management is going to be key. The personnel, same thing. Um, you want them all to be trained on different protocols. They need to kind of be aware of what they're working with so they don't treat all the animals the same. Incoming healthy, incoming sick. Established healthy, established sick. These all need to have different sets of rules. So the personnel needs to all know that. And again, it's not a bad idea to have dedicated personnel. Certain people working in certain groups would be ideal. Um, plus, then they know the job really well and they know how to treat them. Um, the medical protocols. Uh, it's the first time we've seen this slide, so now we're talking about the little animals in there. Um, needs to be efficient um, from a money and labor and, and effectiveness standpoint um, if we're going to be successful. So, uh, you know, we need to have the medical protocols, which uh, we're, we're guilty of not having as many procedures in place as we need to. Um, the diagnostics and treatment are, are going to be key here and again. Um, the records for them. We need to have everything jotted down. What do we do? Um, I'm not going to go into the exact things here, but again, on the shelter medicine site, they'll have some areas that you can go. Um, a lot of the places, IDEX, Antec, if you guys are familiar with them, there are laboratory services. Um, they do a lot for shelters. People tend to think they're just for the clinics and, and, and out there for the, the, the money end of things, but they actually help shelters out. They have discounted programs and they have some great panels for shelter animals, be it dog or cat. Okay. Yep, IDEX, I D E X X. And Antec, A N T E C H. And you, yep, you can send in shelter samples, and you can get some great respiratory panels on dogs and cats. You can get some discounts on blood work as well. Um, <coughs> fungal cultures, ringworm, things like that. You can find places to do that too. A lot of different places will do things. You'll find a lot of vet schools do things. I know Auburn does great ringworm cultures for twelve dollars. All you have to do is stick in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and send it in. A lot of people aren't aware of that. They think they need to go to some big great to do that. Auburn. Auburn's veterinary school. Yep. No, no, no. Auburn is. Alabama. Yeah, Alabama. Yeah. Cornell, I think they're doing all the, the testing for uh, canine influenza. So if, you, if you've got a question about that, uh, Cornell would do that. They're also doing an FIP study, too, in case anybody wants yes. to get in on that. Cornell? Yeah. Great. Yeah. They're asking yeah. Raskies and Andrews to send in fecal samples, so you can oh, get in touch with them. Okay, good. So there's a lot of this out there and a lot of it's low cost, and it just gives us more information. A lot of times we go and pull them out, thinking diagnostics really aren't the way to go. Oh, are they really? Okay, MSC is also doing testing on CIDs. Good, good, good to know. So there's a lot of it out there and that stuff, yeah, they probably aren't really charging it. They just want the sample sent in. And, 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 you know, the more areas you can get sent in, the better information they're going to get. So definitely. Um, they do usually recommend representative samples. So if you get a, a bank of 15, 18, 20 cats that are getting sick, try and get three or four, five of them sampled and sent in. It's going to help you. A lot of times it's going to come back viral. Um, and we're just going to be trying to support them, but it gives us an idea of what we're seeing. And if there is some bacterial issues going on, then those you can definitely treat with some antibiotics and whatnot. But largely, it's just kind of, again, going to give you a good picture of overall what's going on. And then that's going to help you with the incoming animals that are coming in. You know what we're trying to prevent, as well as what the animals get, and we know what we're trying to treat. We'll know if certain groups are going to be a little more um, prone to it. Is it something that's been vaccinated against? Is it not? So that's going to guide us. Our established residents, um, those are the ones that can sometimes become sick when we're not expecting it. Um, and again, we're going to have to decide is it treatable, is it not treatable. Um, sometimes we'll have an animal that came in looking pretty healthy and looking happy, and then it's ending up looking like this. So we know we have something major going on. We've got to decide which way to go and can we get this treated or not. Um, we have to answer other questions like is it something that could possibly be transmitted or not, and we need to worry about that. Uh, again, your treatable is going to be your flea allergy dermatitis, your laceration from the cage, some of those simple things. Non-treatable, um, you know, we're, we're going to see some osteosarcoma, some bone tumors. Um, we're going to see some autoimmune disease. 
autoimmune disease treatable, but not really in a shelter setting. You don't want to be throwing immunosuppressive drugs around like no tomorrow, and then trying to find a home for this animal that's going to be chronically ill. So again, we have, you know you need to be fair to yourselves, and you need to be fair to the animals, and fair to potential adopters when we decide that. Um, so something something to look at and pay attention to. Um, again, we've got quarantine issues in, in our. Uh, established residents when they become sick they've been out into the general population now we've got to put them somewhere I mean, we don't want to quarantine them into the same sick rooms as the incoming guys or or some of the other situations so you'll, you'll need different bays or banks and again separation is going to depend on what we're talking about we're talking about cats we're talking about dogs what do we think they have um, the, the source of the illness is an internal metabolic type disease um, or are we looking at something like an upper respiratory outside thing or a ringworm. So again, what, what are the chances and you know, how is this animal ill? Um, in, internal metabolic type issues, we're not really gonna need to quarantine. We're just gonna need to maybe put in a little quieter area if space allows. Stress management again, which we'll, we'll still discuss a little bit further down the road here. The personnel, um, again, can't, uh, can't emphasize enough on having um, the right people in the right places and having them know what, know what they're doing and realizing, uh, again, to some of this redundancy, if you've seen my outline, you'll see it falls under different headings, but this is designed to, it's like, okay, we've seen personnel four or five times. Well, each time it's been under a different heading, meaning we're talking about different people doing different jobs. So we're not just all in one collective group and everyone can, you like to pitch in and be able to help each other, but within reason. We need to know that, okay, I'm working on incoming healthy. I'm working on incoming sick. I'm working on established healthy, established sick. So we have to be careful. Otherwise, it's gonna be one big soup. Everything's gonna be all mixed together and they're all gonna be pretty soon established and sick. Um, the medical protocols, and again, they're gonna vary. Um, whether it was something that just came in or whether it's an established, uh, an established patient that, that needs care. So again, we're gonna have some diagnostics and treatment. Uh, we're going to have some different options out there for us as far as what to do and what to test for based upon that. Uh, the treatment board and chart that we've already talked about as well. That's great at keeping us on, on, on track and it's not, uh, it's not as cumbersome as individual files, trying to dig through individual files and records. But anything that needs highlighting, um, it can be on that treatment board and chart. A lot of times it's just as easy to check. But again, we need to make sure whether it's a 15, 20 minute at the beginning of the day or the end of the day that we pay attention to that board and keep it up to date because just having it isn't going to be enough. We definitely really need to, to utilize it. And again, uh, with, with the records, um, the, the medical protocols, we're, we're going to be able to make uh, better decisions if we have a record and we know where we're coming from. Um, I'll sometimes land at the shelter and the first thing they want to do is drag me into our sick room and tell them which cats can be let go and we have no records for them. So I'm looking at the cat, I have no idea if they've been in there for one day or if they've been in there for 10 days. And what, you know, what, what were the signs? Was it runny nose? Was it eyes? Was, you know, so without that, me looking at that, I, I might release an animal I probably shouldn't release. Maybe it just came in two days ago from sneezing, but the person locked in at that point didn't know that. So again, that's where records, treatment board, all that's gonna, gonna help me make that decision as well as help, like you said, the volunteers of writing things down. They'll know whether it's something that's been brought to someone's attention or not. And is, is it being medicated or not? And then we're not wasting, uh, you know, your time as well. And, you know, we need to see the progress or the lack thereof. <laughs> okay, so And again, we really are on the cancer. This is where we'll actually talk a little bit more about stress management. Again, you've seen 10 slides on stress management because of how critical it is. In my opinion, it's better than any medication or diagnostic test or treatment we can do, really. Um, the stress management is key in a shelter situation. <coughs> keeping animals healthy, keeping them from being euthanized and getting them home. Crowding space. No one has that problem, right? No. <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah, when we, when we get crowded and when we're lacking space, we've got increased uh, disease introduction. 100 animals obviously are going to bring in a lot more disease than 50 animals. Um, so if, if we do have 100 animals, we need to get them adopted out um, a little bit quicker. When they are close together, the higher contact rate between animals uh, is going to, again, cause the stress, which is going to bring out some of these diseases which will then be shed. Because a lot of these cats that have herpes, they may not be shedding. They're happy and healthy. Life's great. 
you stress them out, they're going to immediately start shedding, and then we're going to be in trouble. And if they're on top of each other, they're going to get it to each other. So we've got that to worry about. Um, the dogs, too. They're going to park their heads off, which is going to seriously compromise their respiratory system. It's going to irritate their throat. And if there's a kennel cough bug within 20 feet of them, they're then going to get it. As well as the stress release of cortisol, that stress hormone that we all have. The animals have it, too. And when that gets up there, we're all going to be, be safe. So crowded space puts us behind the, the eight ball with those two things. Um, reduced air quality. Obviously, we've got all these dogs and cats breathing and sneezing and coughing and, and creating havoc. So that's another uh, problem with that is we get air quality to go down. Uh, most of us do not have the optimum uh, situation for our ventilation and filtration systems. Um, you're going to have compromises in your housing and housing when you're eating when there is crowding in space. Uh, we're going to stick cats in smaller cages. We're going to have them closer together. We're not going to have as much time to do that spot cleaning and take care of them. So all of these are going to become a problem because of the crowding. Uh, it's critical to establish carrying capacity. What uh, what can we have within our four walls? I mean, yeah, we can stack them floor to ceiling and on top of each other and fit 500 animals. But again, is that humane? You know, or would uh, would the humane society come through and tell us we're being inhumane to the animals? very possible. So we need to get those things adapted out and, and by keeping them healthy we can do that. So um, very eye-opening. The, the sheltermedicine.com site will have a discussion on carrying capacity on how many animals the shelter should have as well as what the impact is on that for adopting. I mean, you, you know, we may we may adopt out 500 animals whether you keep a thousand in there or whether you keep 600 in there. Question. Yeah. Uh, just uh, observing the cages in there, just what about like a cat room? Some places have cat rooms where um, a variety of cats are kept together. Yep. I mean that wouldn't be any different than than that because if they sneeze and they're sick. As far as proximity, but no, I think it's a lot better because yeah, of that stress. Room. These guys are all together in the stress. Put them in a room where they can lounge around. If they want to go off on their own, they can. If they want to be together, they can. So the right cats in the right room is, is a great idea. And with your cat room, then we have um, how many of we can keep cats together. Um, normally we'll only put sick cats together, and then they get different strands about the respiratory. But that way, it beats the alternative having to use them them just because they're sick, when we can try to house them, get them up to a home, and if it's viral, then they'll get better than their home. So. And those ones may be happier and less stressed being together. Even they're all sneezing together, it's better being stuck in a cage. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to a slide you had a few minutes ago about the new room mm -hmm. and, and the, the cat tower that you had. Mm -hmm. We were cited by the agriculture department for having not you know, other crew because I think that wasn't our time on the store for our but um, if, if, is that really as important in a rescue or shelter situation as, and I didn't want to get into a department of agriculture mm -hmm. argument, but are we really causing that much I mean, the cats are bored. They don't have any toys to play with because they really don't want to live long. Is that, I mean, it's just kind of thing, but are we really doing ourselves harm by having them there? No, I mean, cleanability is definitely important. Absolutely. Okay, cages, walls, floors, toys, all those things. But if they're moving together, then what's the difference? Yeah, if, if they're all together, they're all healthy, they're all happy, and you've got that kind of a situation in there, yeah, I, I don't see a huge issue with that. Um, but I mean, can it be obviously a source? Yeah, full mites are always a source. You oh, know, sure. Yeah, right. any of that can be. But again, yeah, keeping the cats happy and healthy. And if they're not like them scratching on a stainless steel, yeah, no you know, then that's a good form. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Sustainability with that is if, if you notice something in a cat after they're already in the room. Oh, right, yeah. And then you have an outbreak where you have to clean it. I think well, that's what the point is. Mm -hmm. What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly. We've got big, big, yeah, we can barely stretch. We can barely turn around. You know, the, the food and litter box can't be three foot apart because that cage isn't three foot long. So, yeah, no, there's high stress in there. Now, if you are stuck with a situation like this, hopefully your turnaround time is real quick. You know, hopefully they're getting adopted out in a week to two weeks if they're stuck in these kind of cages. This, this is from our Open County Animal Control facility. We also have the large cages that they have more room. They've got the shelves. We've got some double cages. They've got things to hide in and under. So this is probably, this looks to me like our uh, quarantine slash intake. Yeah, no, I, and I agree with that. I agree with that. And, that's, and that's what we get with a lot of this. So while we're striving to be no kill, we're going to put 300 cats in there and stack them on top of each other. And then you have two, I've seen two and three cats 
in cages like this. With litter boxes not changed. And it's all, you know, we're trying to be, save these animals. We're not doing them any favors. And everything's sick and no one's adopting animals out and the workers are stressed and, you know, it goes on and on and on. It costs you far more money in the long run. But, but, you know, money could have been spent better off trying to get homes for healthy cats. Um, this is maybe a naive question because I'm not a vet and I don't have a lot of training, but um, as a volunteer, um, I think we do a really good job managing the animals coming in and out, mm -hmm. doing a lot of the things you talked about. But when people come in to adopt and potentially you know, meet with an animal, and we have adoption rooms, and we're in and out of those rooms with different people, and you know we're not cleaning in between. So again, it's a naive question. How vulnerable are the animals? Very. Yeah. Very. Every time you're moving, yeah. that's that's okay. my transition to okay. the people. So you know, people wash their hands, and we you know stress that a lot. But yeah. the actually, they find clothing. The clothing, clothing right? You yeah. know, so Our scrub tops are probably the number one. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. I mean, how, what can you do to prevent that type of um, It's tough. It's tough. Again, one of the big things is stress management. Keep animals from being stressed. So if they're healthy to begin with, they're less likely to catch anything yep, anyway. Yeah, they're more apt to be able to ward off this. Because, yeah, but unless we're in the nuclear suits, you know, <laughs> we're not in the hand, wash your hands, yeah. you know, and then you wash the hands, now we're irritating the rest of the way. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, no, I mean, you, 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 like you said, you want the hand washing. People yeah. need to be washing the hands for sure. But if they're going to be in a common area, you're bringing cats in and out like that for people to, to play with them. Right. And so they're the not going to play with one cat. Is there like a time, like is it, is it a couple hours? Is there, is yeah, for the most part, mo most of these cat viruses, are, they don't survive long okay. um, in the environment. And they can also be pretty readily cleaned with most of your okay. easy to clean so detergents. Like, like so what? You don't have Power, to smell hours, either. Hours, well, it depends what we're talking about as far as real active. Do they have to sniff it, lick it? Is it going to be a droplet? Things like that. I mean, it can be around for a while, and that's where you get the full mic transition. So when I'm saying hours, I'm talking about wet droplets. They could be an issue, but then when it's dried, if a cat rubs its face on it or something, it can pick it up. It can get its paw on something and lick it. Um, on scrub tops, I'm not sure from, from a time-wise. What would you think, Dr. Porton? Any idea on that scrub top? <laughs> What's that? All day. I know. Yeah, basically. So, I mean, a lot of times changing, you know, changing scrub tops is great. But, yeah, again, we get into a cost issue if we've got everyone putting on a smock. You know, that could be an issue, too. You can also leave scrub tops in the particular quarantine areas that you're going to and put those on and take them off kind of thing. For personnel. If, if you have a personnel that's cross-trained and has to go to a different area or community. Yeah, the general public could just spray the shirt and bleach and probably I could be real happy, but <laughs> the animals would be a little bit, a little bit better off. Reduction of length of stay, C, and a lot easier said than uh, done. Um, usually underappreciated and underrecognized strategy. But right there for, uh, for stress, let's get them in and out uh, as quickly as we can and they're going to be healthier and happier. Over time, it, it can affect the dog and cats just being in there. Even though they're transitioning in there, things are going okay, but that's not their ideal situation. And the longer we have cortisol and the stress hormones going, the more our immune system takes a hit. So every day that they're in there, that immune system is going down a little bit. Getting stronger in some terms as far as our vaccinations and whatnot, but I think overall mental health, emotion, uh, you know, the spirit, I think that has a lot to do with it. So um, it, it doesn't, it, I'm not saying anything about putting a time limit on it, you know, saying 10, 14, 15 days. Um, it's just let's, let's be conscious of how long they're in there. Um, there's times when I'm surprised. Someone says, oh, you've been here nine months. I have no idea how many other people know it's been in there nine months and what are we doing to actively, you know, promote this guy. Uh, in, in that regard, yeah. like with the rescues, mm -hmm. like say we have uh, some cat cages at like Petco. Yeah. Do you recommend if they're not adopted out to try to get them out of out of the store and into foster and don't keep them in the store too long? Because change the venue, whether it be that or elsewhere, or I know we have cable TV comes in once every you know three weeks or whatever, two weeks, and they'll do a little a part on us. Those are the animals you should start selecting. Does they really store should. Not limit you? Try try and get the turnover. To what? To, to so many weeks in the cage and then have to come back out? Really? We work with a store that does. Yeah. We sold all our stores. Well, we try to keep, to keep them in for just a short period of time, but I'm just wondering if there's like a set time where you think it's better that they just don't stay in here like four weeks or. I would say it's subjective, you know, and it's going to depend on the animal. 
some animals that might be their ideal situation. You know, they just love it. It's great. Other animals, two days might be too much. Yeah. So again, that can be a case by case, a subjective thing. So it is it's very fluid. Again, it's just more a matter of being aware of it and saying, yeah, I need to pay attention to this because there's so many things we're paying attention to. So it's one of those things that can fall through the cracks. So it's just something to kind of be aware of and not let it not let it occur because again, a huge part of the stress. Um, yeah, let's you know be creative. We have to be creative and efficient to ensure that kind of turnover. So if you do have places we have a lot of vet clinics, other so take kittens and whatnot, talk them into taking an adult cat. Right too. Tell us to talk it up. This is a great cat on the line. You know, you can do something to move it through. You know, there's one more thing uh, on this reduction of the state. Mm -hmm. A foster that we recently uh, person approached us, it was a business but I can have a couple of cats wandering around the garage, mm -hmm. adult cats, of course. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah, yeah, we're working on that too. We're, we're enlisting more places to be a festival, that supply store, things like that. Yeah, that clinic's the more we can get out, that's great. Just a business, I guess, signing. That's great. That's great. Send them sign all the disclaimers. <laughs> Don't send them your ring worth caps. <laughs> um, you know, it's the example that they use that they'll elucidate this. If you're adopting all one cat per day, you're really hoping we're adopting all more, but for, for the sake of simplicity, and just to give you an idea of the length of stay, exactly, if you're adopting all one cat a day, and you've got 30 cats in there always, you're kind of rotating, that's your capacity, you're carrying 30 cats, one cat a day, our average length of stay is 30 days. If we've got 15 cats in there and we're adopting out one cat a day, our average length of stay, and it's a rotating 15, it's going to be 15 days. And there's going to be a huge difference in time and stress and money and health in these animals that we're in there for 15 days. So sometimes you're further ahead. Because again, in 15 days, you've got how many animals under both examples? 15 animals. Whether you had 30 in there, you had 15, and a 30 was a much bigger burden and much more stress. So if you've got foster homes, get them out there. If you've got vet clinics, get them out there. So the, the less time that they're stuck in those little cages we saw, the better off we are, however that is. Um, and, and under the shelter medicine site here, um, it's called Adoption Driven Capacity. It looks at how many animals you adopt out a day, and it gives you a formula for how many you have in. And, and it's kind of shocking and surprising, a lot of people don't have it. They're used to 200 animals in their place, and they do this formula and find out that you only have 100. And again, the bottom line of having healthier animals getting more homes, um, does that mean you're going to euthanize more? No. Does it mean we're going to change our strategies and do a lot more to get these animals out? Yeah. And again, it's hard to see immediate results, but in the long run, when you get six months out, and then you track how many animals are sick, how much money do you spend on drugs, how much time do you spend chasing around Medicaid and cats and, and bugs, um, you're going to be much further ahead. Socialization and enrichment uh, is key. Again, in the stress, under the stress management heading here, um, this is one place you can really make an impact. Um, and we're talking about socialization of, of you know, animal to animal and, and with the people as well. Housing in groups of two to seven, ideally. Um, closely monitoring for hidden stressors. Sometimes we've got a cat or two that's stuck in a very stressful situation because we didn't realize it. We, you know, we, we didn't know until we really took time and looked at it. That cat shouldn't be in that group. He's going to be happier in a little cage with a little place. Um, for the majority of animals, though, less stress, strength, and numbers of like kind. They love those cameras. Dogs love to have time when they're playing with each other. Um, you do want to avoid play date type situations, more of an all or nothing. So you have that room that's got five, six cats in there, put them in there. Instead of every day, let's put these two cats in, let's put these guys together. When we're doing the mixing matching, we're just increasing our chance for disease spread. So take them by risk group and let them play together like that. What about dogs? Yep. Visual contact, and that's the best thing, you know, that a lot of the animals will like seeing other ones. If our ears are back and we're hissing, no. If we're growling and barking, no. But other times, if they're able to see other animals, that is less stressful as opposed to a three-sided cage staring at a wall. That's not, that's not going to be ideal for them. Exactly, exactly. Yep. Toys, safe and clean. Um, but definitely they need them. They need a lot of things to play with. Um, hide and seek ability. Love that places that the, the, the play. The, the cages we've got where we have the two cats. Um, and we'll have little crates and things like that in there. Um, it's good for them, it tells you for them, and again, it's going to address that stress end of things. Um, the human socialization, again, from, from a stress standpoint, it's huge. They need to have time petting, brushing, feeding, talking to and playing with the animals. Um, ideally, have an established amount of time per animal. Whether that's five minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes a day, every animal needs a certain amount of time. That helps you with your carrying capacity, helps you know if you're you know, spending the appropriate time. Because again, we're talking about humane treatment of these animals. 
if we have 400 animals in there, we're not going to do that. Um, the biosecurity is critical here. We've talked about the scrub top, transfer and things like that. That's a huge problem. Um, famili familiarity is a plus. So the same volunteers playing with the same animals is great. That goes a long way towards keeping those animals healthy, as opposed to someone different uh, every time. And I will tell you too, as a rescue group, it helps the rescues come in and pick. When we yeah. come in and we've got volunteers, we've got shelter workers who know an animal that can yeah. steer us to it, it saves us time and it, it gives us the turnover faster. That's you. Yeah, it's like yeah. the doctor picking up a case and going off their bottle. Exactly. Yeah. You, you, you know those animals. Yeah. And you're going to place them in a better situation. Yeah. And we're going to take instead of mismatch. Work you know them. Yep, so. yep. Instead of a mismatch, for sure. Um, cleaning. Look at the cleaning agents for sure. And, and, and it's not all what, what it's cracked up to be. The last one there, no quaternary ammonium disinfectant. First thing on the label is parvicidal, parvicidal. Well, they're not. They're finding the not really. And a lot of places still use those. That used to be the, the first first place we went to. This is probably the best up and coming there. The accelerated hydrogen peroxide is awesome. Um, bleach is the first one. These other two are bleach light. So it can't be bleached. It does beat up equipment. You gotta worry about corrosion issues. It, it is tough on cat and dog's respiratory systems. So that's huge from a health standpoint. If we're constantly abusing the respiratory system, we're gonna get sick. So we gotta be careful. Yeah, we're killing all the germs, but guess what? Everything's more sick now. Well, so how long we, does that stay in there as far as the odor from the bleach? Depends on ventilation. Depends on your ventilation. So ventilation's great. Um, you need contact time. Yeah, you have to have contact time with the agents. Um, so make sure it's on an appropriate amount of time. Make sure it dries, and then yeah, get the ventilation going. Because it is, it bothers me at the rate that you're supposed to use that. And again, you'll find that online. The protocols, have them, review them, audit them. Um, having them means have them. Review them means are we still using primary ammonia compounds. Audit means go out and find out if we're doing it. It's great to have a procedure that says 10 minutes set time, but when it gets sprayed on and dried off, it's not doing anything. So all three of those are critical. Have them, review them, audit them. What's the deal with the spot now? It doesn't kill things? Is that what you're saying? Or oh, it does, but it, it, it's not great against parvo okay. and some other things, which is one of the big things the label says, so everyone jumps on that. Um, but again, it's part of a rotating issue. Is it not a bad thing to use with multiple deals? Yeah. No. I have a quick question on the bleach and parvo. The bleach mixture, is like, I think it's 32 to 1. Does that kill the parvo virus or not? Yep. Because two years ago when I went to MSU conference, um, one of the best that was there said it did. It depends on your contact time. Are you just wiping off or are you not wiping off? Are you cleaning before it's being disinfected? Exactly. Organic debris. Yeah. There's a bunch of poop and stuff like that on there. The bleach isn't good with organic debris. Organic debris can just deactivate it. So yeah, putting the bleach on a bunch of poop, and now you're still going to have some bacteria when all of a sudden done. So the organic debris has to be off of there. But no, bleach is still probably one of the best things out there. Nothing's really found a way around, including my nose. Spot <laughs> um, cleaning versus complete. We went into that briefly, and again, you can find that online. That's huge from a stress management standpoint. Uh, very big. Okay, the cleaner, biosecurity. Again, just like our scrub cops and handling animals is going to be bad. Um, these guys can be tracking stuff all over on their boots and on their clothing and whatnot, especially if they're doing the home move animals around. That's probably the number one reason we're, you know, keep stuff spread around. Um, training and again, monitoring, making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, we've got trustees from the, from the jail, so some of them, their heart really isn't into it. And we find out after the fact, the last month, they really haven't been doing, you know, any cleaning or doing anything. So you need to know that who's doing it uh, takes it seriously.